Ladies and gentlemen, we are coming to our next presentation at the WTUS conference, and we will learn now a lot about radio frequency. How important is the antenna design? So key considerations for optimal antenna and RF performance in wearable devices. And it's a great pleasure to welcome now Yuka uh, Sörstret. Uh, he is the CEO of Radientum. Um, he has been leading low and mid-range uh, developments at the Nokia Lum Lumia. Perhaps you remember these phones, uh, those phones uh, some years ago. He developed the product engine development there for over 15 models. So during his 20-year career, so he's really deep in that in that topic. And he has a strong background in RF development and testing, including experiences in complex manufacturing projects. So currently, he leads an RF and antenna expert team that specializes in wearables, medical and IoT devices. So all the tiny devices around us. And Yuka supervises the design development, process validation and product planning for small and large projects. So Yuka, it's a great pleasure to have you with us, and we are we are we, we stay tuned for learning more about the right radio frequency design and uh, how you could help us in the wearable ecosystem to make better connected devices. Yuka, welcome. Thank you, Christian. Uh, yeah, let's share my screen uh, for that. Good. Uh, just get the point that I also. So like that. So thank you, Christian, and uh, good day, afternoon, and good evening, everybody online. So uh, my name is Jukka Sjöstedt, uh, CEO of Radiantum, and uh, I will discuss about this topic, so the optimal antenna and RF performance in wearable device. So um, uh, Radiantum is a company that uh, we are engineering company focusing on the RF and antenna development for demanding applications. So um, that wearable and medical is really on the core of the focus. And uh, I will talk about from that perspective that what we have done within the last five years. Um, so we are dealing about uh, 50 uh, wireless uh, projects per year. So there's a lots of experience from the wireless products from the IoT side, but uh, specifically on the wearable and the um, um, medical side also. So I'm speaking from that perspective. And today's agenda is, is uh, divided in three parts. So first I will uh, explain why does the antenna performance matters. So why you should take uh, or be interested why how your antenna is doing. Uh, then specifically uh, something about the wearable uh, device challenges. What is challenging for the wearable device and uh, how to tackle those. And then the third part is about the common pitfalls from the project, what we have seen in the past. So I want to share that <clears throat> and help you to not uh, to hit on the same same obstacles, what, what has happened or what we have seen in, in the past. So altogether, everything should be aiming that how to ensure the optimal wireless performance uh, for uh, your product. So I will start for that, like that why the antenna performance matters. So uh, every device need to comply with the regulatory uh, requirement. So it might be CE mark or FCC or UK uh, CA. So whatever that is, but typically these requirements are well defined and uh, easy to understand that you have to fulfill the effective isotropic radiative power or specific absorption rate. And these are limits what you cannot really fail. You cannot sell, sell your product if you don't feel, fulfill these. Second category for the uh, requirement setting is the network operators, and they have their own requirements also. Typically, they are the TRP or TIS, so the TX or RX uh, 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 figures over the air. So LoRa and Sigfox have the, uh, their own uh, requirement. And on the cellular side, AT&T, for example, has their own requirement for the TRP and TIS. So those are really well defined. But you, if you don't fulfill those, you cannot really sell your category as a labeled to Sigfox or LoRa device or the performance criteria or in the operator channels. But then the third group, which I think is the most important one for the product owners, is the user experience and field performance. So 
This is where the under nice is really a key component that it's affecting your device battery life. It's affecting on the range, what you have for the device, data rate, uh, industrial design even. So it's all about how your end customers are uh, seeing and feeding your product as a complete uh, wearable device that is it good enough and they will decide that is it a good or bad. So you have to keep all of these in mind when you are designing a product. But then what is actually important from the RF and antenna point of view? So from the antenna point of view, uh, it's all about the electromagnetic uh, equations and the electromagnetic behavior, how it's behaved on your device. But you as a product owner or, or product maker don't need to care about this because the at the big picture, it's about compromising the size and the performance of the device. So in a wearable device, typically the size is a challenge because you don't have the size available in your device to make a good performance for your product. But there are more, more dimensions in, the, in this uh, question that if you have a more budget, so meaning that you can put more money in the production technology, you could use more RF-friendly materials, more uh, advanced technology to make the antenna like LDS, laser uh, structure, um, uh, what is this, laser structure, uh, laser direct structure uh, technology. So basically you are printing the antenna inside the mechanics and fully using the 3D shape. So it's about the compromise for your use case or your requirement on the field what is good and what is important for your product. So there's no single answer for this. It's about a specific use case and then compromise between the size and the performance typically. So then there are two kind of uh, categories what I would like to emphasize typically that what are important for the wireless products and what are common for every wireless product, whatever that is. And the first one is the size of the device. It's quite obviously that uh, when you have a device like a smart ring, uh, wireless earbuds, smart watch or smart glasses, uh, you have limited space available for your electronics, battery and the antenna. But then that is still somehow doable if you have a single band device like LoRa, Sigfox or Bluetooth because the frequency range is quite narrow what you need to cover. But then when you move into wideband antennas, for example, category M1, where you have to fulfill from the 700, uh, sorry, 600 megahertz in the worst case, uh, up to 2.7 gigahertz, the antenna design comes really, really complicated. And then you really have to understand what's your target where you are aiming because you cannot do a device what covers the whole world. And if you do that, it is possible your performance is not good in uh, uh, all, the, all the regions where you want to go. So it's a compromise. The second category, what I would like to emphasize uh, as a common area is that body effect for the antenna and RF. So um, wearable device, there is typically always body nearby and body causes losses. Sometimes you need to penetrate through the tissue. Sometimes you need to use the body as a uh, part of the uh, guiding the radiation. So body is, is a big part of the uh, wireless uh, wearable device uh, design. And then you have the SAR limits, which is the specific observation rate that you cannot exceed. And uh, that's like a hard limit. So. Let's look about more about this body effect. So uh, how does it actually is visible on your product design and how you should take that into account? Uh, here's an example about the implant, which is uh, done by 300, uh, 433 megahertz ISM band radio. So it's inside the stomach. And there you really ha like have to maximize the penetration through the tissue so that it can hear the gateway outside the body. Well, while you are doing this, you have to also take into consideration that uh, you have to keep in mind that there is this hard limit for the SAR. 
So this picture is an example from the Bluetooth smartwatch. So this is a cross section from the hand and the, from the watch and the watch bezel is working as an antenna in this case. And this heart beating uh, animation, what you are seeing there is basically when the RF is changing the face and uh, the uh, light blue area where it's going, it's, it's showing that the energy is actually going now through the hand and that is causing more higher SAR, SAR levels and also uh, from the functional point of view, this is not the situation where we would like to be with the smartwatch. We would like that the majority of the energy absorbs away from the hand, away from the watch, and that's the usable energy, uh, what can be used as a connectivity uh, <clears throat> in, in your uh, smartwatch case. Then totally different kind of body effect comes uh, when you have a, earbuds, wireless earbuds. So there you don't longer maximize the uh, total uh, radiated power or antenna efficiency because the use case, what you have there is that your wireless earbuds is in your ear and your receiving phone in the worst case, it's located on your back pocket. So the RF need to travel from front and it, when you turn the head also, it's, it's making this, it's even worse. So it has to travel from the front to back or from back to back here. And basically what in this case, what you are optimizing, you are optimizing so-called creeping waves so that the RF will travel on the body, uh, not through there because you don't have the uh, line of sight for the phone. It's have to travel on the body and you are minimizing then the losses. And in this case, in this simulation, it's showing that's uh, like 75 dB attenuation from uh, pocket, back pocket to the ear. So you have to optimize a different kind of case, a different kind of parameters for different devices. Um, then uh, going one step further is that before you start selling your product, you have to pass your operator requirement. And this might be actually a, a really bad thing in many cases that you start planning your product, you are doing your product, and then you notice at the end that actually the requirement to pass the operator uh, requirement might be a wrist for case for like a smartwatch, but it might be also a free space. And then the uh, performance might not meet the operator requirement uh, target. So you have to, at the same time, make sure that you will pass the operator requirement uh, test case and fulfill the end user uh, use case as a maximum performance that you can fulfill the boat. So it's not too simple. So it's once again compromise what you need to optimize for the device. Then, then some of the common pitfalls. Um, I once again divided these into two categories. First one is what we are seeing way too often is a copy paste issue. Um, what has worked in the different application in the past does not necessarily work in your current environment. And um, we are seeing this way too often that um, uh, product owners have copied a design from another environment and then changed something what they don't understand and then the, uh, what was good in other device doesn't anymore work. So um, if you do copy paste, you really have to make sure that you understand what you are doing. This works well in the asset tracker or simple IoT device, but in wearable device, the whole device works as an antenna and it's not antenna, it's not a separate component. Every wire in your device is part of the antenna and have effect on the performance. Uh, the other thing what we have seen a lot is that late start of the RF design. So 80 to 90% of the performance is defined by the antenna location. And uh, in this, this area, we are seeing the cases that um, there has been a company developing the proof of concept device, focusing on the uh, electronics or the mechanics design, and then really end of the product uh, they are asking that, can you please select the antenna for our product? Well, the RF doesn't work like that. So um, 
your performance is really, really tied to the location of the antenna. And you should start from the RF design that checking that where the antenna could work and where to place the RF modules to minimize the losses and to maximize the performance. So these are the two categories what we are seeing way too often uh, uh, with, with the, our partner projects. Um, then I have four examples from the real use case uh, from the customer projects, starting with the smart ring. So in here, uh, the antenna was affecting actually the um, performance on the field. So the production quality was the issue that the, the Bluetooth low energy uh, performance was good enough with the best units, but the production has the large variation. And uh, that large variation caused that uh, you need to scrap some of the products because those were not fulfilling the customer demand. And root cause for that was the, that the really small dimensions in the smart ring called me uh, causes mechanical assembly variation, and that detuned the antenna and then the performance was, was not what was expected. And how it was sold that the antenna topology was changed to a different one, so it can tolerate more uh, this dimension change, and in this case, it tolerates more changes on the ground plane. So it was done by analyzing the with the simulation tool, so that uh, the tolerance analysis was done. So the tuning components plus then the mechanical height variance plus the assembly variance. And all together, that was analyzed to be on the like reasonable level, what was uh, needed for the field. Uh, second example is from these two wireless earbuds. What I showed already this uh, picture where the crossbody performance was introduced. So there, it's it's a quite challenged environment because you have to maximize the device performance in a really small form factor device. And uh, when you are doing that with the prototypes, it's really expensive to build the prototypes and then measure, and it's also really slow. So what is extremely challenging in this is that the environment uh, for the uh, earbuds is changing a lot. And by that, I mean that uh, people have different kind of ears, they have different dimensions on the body, and that has a significant effect to body losses. So it's really hard to define that kind of standard use case and knowing that uh, how well it's performing with the with other people. So you really need to do to save time and money to simulate this tolerance analysis and simulate this cost body performance to be able to really know your performance target on the field and understanding your environment and what is effect when something changed if you have a large ear or big uh, small ear how your environment is changing and how that is affecting then on on the antenna performance all of these can be done with the simulation tools um, then third example from the heart monitoring implant so this was uh the whole product, what we did with the customer, so that uh, um, on the other hand, you have to, like I said earlier, that you have to maximize the performance from the body, so inside the body where the device is surrounded by body liquids. There's the SAR limit and there's the wireless range requirement. So this environment, so the body liquids have significant effect to body losses. So even with the different organs inside the body have a different uh, RF characteristic uh, values. So it's hard to maybe see that these are human feet, their hands, and this is cross section from the, from the body. And on the right side, there's the same cross section with the implant inside the body. And then, then uh, it's, it's uh, simulated and you can see that the RF fields are generated differently. There are that kind of hotspots coming inside the body. And you have to optimize that, that you don't uh, break the limits on the saw, but you have the use case required range available. So in this case, there was simulated different kind of radio technologies that um, from the physics point of view, the lower frequency have better rates. But at the same time, when you have the lower frequency with the best range, 
you have a small device. And with the small device, you cannot achieve the same antenna performance than uh, with the higher frequency. So in this case, the heart monitoring implant was done with the Bluetooth, so 2.4 gigahertz ISM band, because that was so like a good compromise and the availability of the mod modules were, were good. So uh, that was selected for, for this, this product uh, based on the simulations that uh, it was fulfilling the requirement for the SAR and the range and the module availability and software reusability was the best solution for that. Uh, then, yeah, still, so the point here is that you need to select the right technology for your case. If you build the device, it's slow and expensive, but you can simulate all of these different, uh, you don't have to select the module yet. You can uh, simulate that based on the antenna and RF performance only without any module selection, just by the looking the frequency point of view that what is the best one to fulfill uh, the required scenario. Then um, the last example uh, is a uh, CAT M1 smartwatch. So in this one, this was aiming uh, for the AT&T approval for the US. So they have the TRP requirement and uh, there was a prototype available already and it was passing the requirement. But then there was introduced a new uh, mechanical vendor for the bezel part, uh, for the watts, and that dropped the results by 1.5 dB and it was not anymore passing the uh, requirement for the TFD. And the root cause for not passing was that the new part was painted with the paint, black paint, which included the carbon. And carbon is really uh, like a lossy material for the RF. So what happened that uh, the uh, radiated part, which was the bezel, was actually sucking part of the radiation uh, itself and it did radiate outside the device. And uh, that killed the performance of it. And the solution for that was that uh, during the R&D that was analyzed during the RF characterization for the bezel. So basically RF properties was measured for the part so that it can be uh, identified and verified that the problem was in this part. And this loss tangent and the epsilon R are the uh, parameters for the RF. And end result was that the supplier changed the uh, paint for the part and then that was more RF friendly and you could pass then the certification without any, any bigger changes. So key takeaways from, from this presentation, uh, we have limited time. So uh, I could talk about, about day and happy to discuss after, after this seminar also. So start early with the RF and antenna design. So it doesn't mean that you have to have a full day uh, person working for the antenna in the concepting phase, but it needs to start on the concepting phase already. Uh, every wearable device is a unique case. So be aware not to use this copy paste method because that really easily goes wrong. And uh, to be able to maximize your performance, it's always need to be a case specific uh, optimization for the device. And when you integrate antenna into a device like wearable device always have, the antenna is not a passive component. So the whole device is part of the antenna. It's like in the IoT devices that antenna uh, generates the uh, uh, frequency resonance, but it might be the actual, the, uh, the PCP is actually radiating. So it's not the antenna which is radiating, it's just generates uh, the resonance frequency for the right frequency. So whole device is part of the antenna, be aware of that. So every wire, battery, flex in the device is affected. And if you compare the off the shelf components, that is not your device performance ever. So integration always change the performance. So you cannot, uh, compare the components to another. You have to always uh, do the integration and then you can see that what is the best one for your product. 
And with doing this RF simulation, so electromagnetic simulation, you know before you have the prototype in your hand that will you pass the acceptance criteria, whatever that is. So um, you can save money and time uh, with the simulations to going in the market and know early enough that will you meet the uh, criteria what you need to need, need to pass. Yeah, that was all from my side. So thank you. And uh, do we have any questions there? Thank you, Yuka. So that was really a very good lecture about how to use uh, the right antenna design. Um, I mean, I, 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 could you stop share, share screening, please, with yeah. us? And then we are both on the same. Yeah. Then we are both on the same virtual stage, Yuka. So um, my, my my first question is regarding. Um, I mean, you are producing antenna components, right? So what, what is the performance difference between different antenna components? And, and what, is the, what, what is the best one? Um, <clears throat> yeah, good question. I, I think I didn't cover that at all in my presentation. So uh, right answer is that it depends. But uh, I would say that uh, um, there's no difference, really, if we are comparing antenna manufacturers from the SMD component point of view. So uh, there are multiple vendors who are providing antenna components, but the performance is pretty much the same for everything. But all the uh, components are optimized for this uh, free space uh, environment. So when you put that component in your device, your performance is something else. So um, I would say that uh, um, when we are collaborating, or let's say so that we are independent uh, uh, partner, and we are collaborating with the many uh, antenna providers. And we even have the, some of the simulation model from the antenna providers, and we can help you to select the best possible component for your application. So to answer the question, there's no any magical component which outperm performs all the others. So they are in a way same, but it depends from your device, which one is then the best one, and we can help you to select. I see. So you integrate at least uh, the whole range of antennas which are available in the world and, and you fit them to the best purpose for this wearable individual design uh, you have to create. I mean, I mean, we learned that that at least the whole device is part of the antenna. And then we also learned that even the color change could have an impact, what I, where I was really surprised. I mean, I mean, having just a, a black printed uh, cover and, and there was carbon in and then the loss was... Uh, what was the loss already 1.5 dB? Uh, I mean, this is amazing. And, and so you really have to take care of. So, but what is the best production technology? We learned also that there was laser direct structure, uh, for example, so printed antenna design. So what is the best technology you could, uh, you could choose for creating a custom antenna for wearable devices? Um, yeah, once again, that is a compromise. Uh, typically on the wearable device, if you need to get the best performance, these LDS, so laser direct structure antennas, so where you print the antenna basically inside the enclosure, uh, there you have a benefit that you can maximize the free space inside your device, what would be not used for anything else typically uh, for the antenna. And you can gain better performance by doing that compared to uh, like a, a PCP strip line antennas where it's like 2D structure. So the 3D st structure is the, I would say the right answer here that uh, whatever the technology is, it might be the LDS, it might be a flexible uh, PCP for flex cable antenna, or the, it might be metal stamped antenna, whatever that is, uh, uh, as long as it's using the 3D shape for all the possible uh, space within the device. So LDS is the best one, but it's also might be the expensive one. So compromising. Yeah, and, and, and we also learned from your recommendation. I mean, start early, do not copy paste. Uh, the whole device is an antenna. That was what we discussed right now. Every integration changes the performance at least. And, and the last part was very interesting. So you also recommend always electric magnetic simulations, right? Um, but my question would be, even if you do all these steps, you have then, uh, let's say, a proof of concept. You have the first piece uh, and you test it. 
And then, I mean, I'm testing it in the real environment. Is there a possibility to do over the air measurements even? Uh, yeah, yeah, true, of course, yeah. Uh, really good question. So um, <clears throat> what we can do in house is um, from the concepting, early concepting, giving the ideas where the antenna should be placed, we can do everything in house until the R&D over the air verification. So there was actually in the presentation a picture from our uh, antenna lab. So it's a fully automatic system. So you always have to measure that. Even though these simulations are accurate, uh, typically within some 2DP uh, accuracy uh, from the real world, it's always that there are some surprises in the device what uh, you haven't simulated correctly, or then it behaves somehow differently compared to the simulation. So you have to do also this R&D test uh, before you go in the official certification lab. And yes, we are able to do that in, in, in the house where we have our own lab for, for the basically all the technology up to ultra wide band uh, here in Tampere. Okay, very interesting because I mean, we learned also from the smart ring example you mentioned that even very tiny uh, variations in the manufacturing line, right, could, could create a totally different RF uh, uh, design or RF impact, right? Yeah, so uh, I would summarize that example so that whatever your um, wearable device is, uh, when you have a tolerance in the mechanics, always that, uh, for example, if you have an on-ground antenna, meaning that you have the PCP on the bottom and antenna is on top of that, the small change is there, even like uh, some hundreds of uh, parts of the millimeter can have the performance effect. And we know that uh, from the mechanical structure, there is always some variance there. So um, in wearable devices where the dimensions are small, all the small changes are really can be uh, important ones. So okay. um, you um, cannot underestimate that, that uh, tolerances in the production because then you lose money in the production and that's no okay. benefit for anybody. Yeah, but I think important is that, that, that you are able to do the OTA measurement. And I think this is a very, very beneficial part uh, in, your, in your service uh, uh, you could offer to, to all wearable manufacturers. Uh, one last question, because that was also a bit new for me, because I always thought, okay, if we talk about an implant and more and more people are talking about implants, not only about patches or so really going, going deeper with their healthcare devices and, and uh, um, especially in the heart uh, monitoring implant area. Um, I always thought that the lower the frequency, the better, um, because we have these shields based on water, based on uh, our, and we even learned that the organs are different, right? So from the, from the shielding, so you have some organs which are more sh shielding the, the RF component and less, but but you told us that, that you used Bluetooth for, for a, a heart implant. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Because 2.4, I think it's very difficult to get, the, get to get the information out of your body, right? Yeah, yeah. So this is once again <clears throat> that compromise. So in a way, it's it's um, if I simplify it uh, by explaining with the link budget. So when you have the RF uh, output power, let's say 10 dBm, or in Bluetooth, it's it's about eight. But then then uh, with the lower frequency radius, you could have more power. But then you have the saw limit there. But if we think about only the RF and the device, so lower frequency penetrates tissue better, but then when your device is small, your antenna efficiency is not so good. So with Bluetooth, you can achieve something like a minus five, minus six dB efficiency inside the body. Uh, but if you go for the 868 or 433 megahertz lower frequency where you have better penetration, your antenna efficiency drops a lot. Mm -hmm. So you will end up having this kind of uh, different link budget that if you use the lower frequency, you have less losses on the body, but worse antenna performance. So you have to compare this one to select which one is the best one. So yes, the Bluetooth selection in this case, um, it was enough for the use case. So meaning that the gateway outside the body was enough to read it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not uh, long distance and also need to consider that we are different kind of persons. Some have more uh, 
tissue around you than the others. So <clears throat> there are corner cases then where it might not work anymore. But then you as a product owner have to decide what is your target performance, where it should work. Okay, the, the implant for the, 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 the tight guys and the implant for the obesity guys. So we have different implants with different RF components. So we see already there, even there already, we have a differentiation and we have an individual, mm -hmm. individual design of every variable piece. And I mean, Yuka, we could talk hours and hours about that because <laughs> yeah. we are a very sophisticated area. And I mean, the most important area, you mentioned also that 80 to 90% of the performance of a wearable device is based on the antenna location. And, and I mean, clear, uh, we all hate the devices which are not connected fast and which are not connected probably, probably so uh, clear. Uh, this is a core element and we always forget to do that upfront, right? And, and so mm -hmm. you with Radientum could help there. Yuka, it, it's a pleasure having you with us. Please, um, ladies and gentlemen out there who, who want to ask a question to Yuka, use our chat bar below um, you could directly ask questions to Yuka and we will forward them to him and he will answer or he will directly go in a direct connectivity with you. Uh, I hope uh, you reach out to Yuka or to us uh, to get more information about the right RF design for your wearable device. Yuka was a pleasure having you with us. Uh, stay healthy. Hope to see you soon. Perhaps next year in the real WTUS conference in San Francisco would be a pleasure to have you there. And ladies and gentlemen, that was Radientum uh, with Yuka um, directly from Olu, uh, the former Nokia center, <laughs> let's say. <laughs> okay. Thanks right. so much. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Christian. Okay. Bye-bye.